return, please, to Acts chapter 11. 11th chapter of Acts, and beginning with the 19th verse, including the chapter, the 30th verse. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. The tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he would, should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dirt throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of calling of Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. We are dealing week by week, with the matter of fellowship, Christian fellowship, New Testament fellowship, that which is to be the foundation upon which the church rests. In the past, I have read many articles and books on the subject of the church, and somehow all of them, true as they were, have failed to be implemented in any striking or significant degree in my experience. Because it is rather as though we were looking at the, the shell, we were looking at the form, we were looking at the edifice, rather than looking at that which has made it possible. And so we find that the word has a great deal to say about this subject of poinonia, fellowship, communion, sharing, and participation. And when we have come individually into a relationship with the Lord Jesus, as we saw this morning, and we'll continue to look at next Lord's Day morning, then we find that there is the grounds of fellowship. There's the possibility of it. The church has a corporate existence because the individuals are in a relationship with the Lord uh, sharing his life w with him, and thus they can share with each other. Now, we are seeing this sharing in, w in effect. We're seeing it at work in the portion that's been read for. Uh, just to remind you of what we saw in beginning measure, at least, last Sunday evening, was namely this, that persecution broke out in Jerusalem regarding Stephen which caused the believers, the disciples, to flee, the apostles aboard Jerusalem. And everywhere they went, they went preaching the word, and the Lord went with them confirming the word, with signs and wonders, as we elsewhere read. And so they had the ministry of reconciliation committed to the rank and file of believers. This must come again. We must see this. It must grip your heart and be fixed in your mind and become the very foundation of your life. If you are in Christ, you are a witness for Christ. 
and the missionary for Christ. We must see this. Too long have we been governed and influenced by Rome. Someone has said Rome is the mother of us all, speaking of Protestantism. And in a sense, it is as though Rome is the brick wall up which the ivy of Protestantism has tried to climb, keeping itself separate and yet somehow clinging to it. And in these days, I believe the Spirit of God is trying to release the vine of his planting and get it to grow on the trellis of his word rather than on the trellis of history. And it's very difficult because the vine is deeply entwined and it's in the rocks. Have you ever tried to take ivy off of a wall? It's very difficult. Very difficult indeed. And sometimes you'll actually pull chunks of mortar out. And you'll split bricks because these roots have gone in and have gone deep. And we thus have to recognize that the very form in which we're seated tonight, the very building in which we are, the decoration, all are traced back not to the Word of God, but to Rome. Perhaps we could go and say to the synagogue of our Lord's day, this to some degree would be true. But again, I would say back to Rome. Now, I do not feel that in my heart the, the least iconoclastic, the iconoclast is the icon breaker. I, I don't feel that, that I have that. I'm certainly not fighting this arrangement of the pulpit in the center and the people spread around it. I, I do not believe that we could, we could change all of this and change nothing for the better. This would be a simple mechanical change. The change that we have to make is a change not in architecture or necessarily in organization to begin with, but it's a change in attitude, change in your attitude toward your life. That you're not simply one that's to occupy 22 inches of space on, in, in an auditorium regularly and faithfully, though I must admit we miss you when you aren't here occupying that space. And we're delighted when you are. But we, our reason for it is that if you're here, perhaps you're going to hear from the desk and from the Word and by the Spirit that for the remaining six days of the week, God wants you as a witness for Jesus Christ. And hearing this and sensing that the prime evangelistic strategy of the New Testament was gossiping the gospel on the part of everyone that named the name of Christ that this was the means of evangelism. In fact, if you'll study the tradition of the Old of the New Testament and the writings of the Church Fathers, you will find that when the believers assembled, it was primarily a secret or private meeting. They really didn't know often who was going to do the teaching. Frequently they didn't, but they did have a man stationed at the door. Perhaps we could say the janitor was more important than the preacher because it was his responsibility to invite everyone who did not know the Lord Jesus just not to meet with them. Because, you see, it was an assembly of the believers worshiping the Lord, being nourished in the truth and faith, and then they were going out to witness, and the evangelism was to be where the people resided, in the streets, in the marketplace, in the home. And we find that it's increasingly difficult to get the unsaved into our evangelistic meetings, into our churches. It's increasingly difficult to reach them in what we would call the traditional American pattern of evangelism. And we are thus being forced by the sheer weight of necessity to rediscover God's plan, God's means of evangelism. And it is this, that where you go, whether it be on to work tomorrow or to visit friends or wherever it is, you go for whatever task you find necessary to go, but you go as a witness for Jesus Christ. I'll never forget the experience I had in the Maban tribe in Africa. I had uh, been introduced to a man, and I said, oh, you're here on business. You see, at that time, the British were in charge of the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, as it's called. And they had drawn a uh, line, the ninth parallel, and said there would be no Muslims above, below that parallel, and no missionaries above it, incidentally, just uh, yesterday. 
I believe it was established in the Sudan. It may have been a few days earlier, but I believe it went into effect yesterday in the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan that hereafter it will be illegal to talk to anyone about religion other than his own. In other words, it will be a defense for which missionaries can be excluded if they talk to pagans about Christ, or if they talk to Mohammedans about Christ, or if the say, if pagans talk to the Christians about uh, their religion, it will be equally criminal. But of course, it isn't criminal for the Mohammedans to talk to anyone about their religion because this is the state religion, and it's practically been a death knell to all witness in the Sudan. But I'll never forget that day, as I tell you, when I met this man introduced to him. He Muhammad, obviously. Oh, I said, you're here on business, are you? You're here as a trader. He looked at me with the utmost of sincerity and earnestness, and he said, no. My business is to be a messenger of the prophet. I'm only here trading to pay expenses. Why? Here is the messenger of the prophet. And this has characterized Islam, and probably is the reason why nine people are being converted to Christ for one, are being converted to Islam for one being converted to Christ in Africa. Because they have learned that every Muslim is a messenger and a servant of the prophet. Now they've taken it right out of the book. Do you view yourself tomorrow as being scattered abroad, not by the primarily for the necessity of earning a living? Obviously, that's important. But your real reason for being there is to live Christ before these that are without it, and to intercede for those who know him not. And as opportunity is given, and you can control the conversation to witness to them concerning Christ. This is true with your recreation. This is true with other interests. Whatever community or society you may belong to, maybe some of you are members of the Garden Club or the PTA or the Veterans, whatever collateral organization you're a part of is to be viewed as a, a legitimate and proper field of witness. Scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. Driven by the sword of those who thought they could extinguish the faith, they actually scattered it. Now, we must see this, that the fellowship of witness includes every member of the body of Christ. I can't say it too frequently. I can't say it too strongly. Until you come to the place in your heart of hearts that you realize that evangelism is your responsibility. Your responsibility. He gave evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and the evangelist, incidentally, is not the man who comes for special meetings. He would be fitted into the scriptural definition of an exhorter. He gave evangelists, church planters, pioneer missionaries, and, the, and pastors, all the elders, and teachers, as those having elders with a special ministry of teaching, for the perfecting of the saints into the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry is to live Christ before the sinner, intercede for sinners, and witness to them. Now we must see this. It's imperative that you thus view yourself. You've got to see it. If you are to fit into God's plan for your life and have any part in that which he's doing, this must become a reality. I believe it's imperative if you are to know the fullness of the Spirit. For you remember in... Uh, Luke, the 13th chapter, I believe it is, you have, or 11th, you have the account of the man who came to his neighbor at midnight and knocked and demanded bread, asked for bread. The man, the goodman of the house, got up, not because they were neighbors, but because the one knocking was concerned about his inability to give bread to the hungry that came to him expecting to be fed. I believe that we are on the grounds to expect God to meet us with the fullness of himself and the empowering of his spirit. When the reason for it is not our own comfort, not our own joy or peace or blessing, but the reason is that we might have bread to give to the hungry. Now, they went everywhere and the hand of the Lord was with them. 
The hand of the Lord will be with you. The hand of the Lord will bless that work. I do not believe that you have to become necessarily the extroverted personality that talks to everyone he meets and gives facts to everyone he sees. You may. And if you can, and if this is true to your nature and personality, and you can do it sincerely, then the Lord bless you. We certainly need it. But I think that when you have something so wonderfully real in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can talk to people without embarrassment. I, it's amazing, you know, how in the recent Cuban crisis it was easy to talk with perfect strangers about the situation. What is it? Is something that you share. Of course, they were as interested as you were. But I think people, I find people, perhaps it's something the Lord's doing in my heart. But I'm finding it increasingly easy to talk with people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'm not trying to sell them something. I'm not trying to promote something. I'm not trying to get them to respond to a formula. I'm just trying to get them to converse about the things of the Lord. Now, if you feel that witness is essentially get selling Jesus. If you feel that it's getting them to sign up on a formula, you're going to be intimidated. You're going to be silent. First place, they won't do it. The second place, if they did, it would probably be just to accommodate you. And the third place, it's not necessarily what God wants. But you see what he's asking for is that, that he's just real, wonderfully real. And you talk with him. Now, you don't have to shoot them full of scripture verses. So this is good. It's wonderful to be able to turn to the Word and say, well, you see, this isn't my opinion what God's Word says. But I, I think it's a little stilted to just talk to the Scripture verses when you're dealing with the unsaved. Translate it into the language that they know and communicate with it. Just talk. Oh, we ought to read the Sermon on the Mount daily, not for a little while at least, until we find out that you can talk about heaven and hell and about redemption and grace in one syllable word our Lord Jesus. And so we must see this. I, I, I promise you that I'm going to dwell on this until the Spirit of God grips our hearts and we become a witness to people and find time and make time and take time just to talk with folk about the Lord. Do it simply. Do it directly. Do it sincerely. Never talk above your experience. And just simply be free. And you want others to know that's what they did. And this is the primary witnessing staff. All right. We find that it was the fellowship of witnessing was shared by all. But then there was the matter of church responsibility that came back upon the apostles. There was a group established, whereas you are the one that will probably have the best contact in your neighborhood, in your community, to your friends, to those you meet. You invite me there, and there's a whole wall. I, I'm I, I'm rather troubled when people haven't here, or perhaps I should be troubled they haven't, but elsewhere I've often had people say, would you come over? Mrs. So-and-so next door wants to receive the Lord. Well, go ahead, leave it to the Lord. You don't need me. Oh, I wouldn't know how. Well, that's what we're here for, and it's always a reflection on the pastor and teacher. People don't know how to leave the Lord. Do not know how to get them to close with Christ and guide them and help them. But this is to be shared by all. This everyone here tonight ought to go be able to go out tomorrow and the remainder of the week and count on you to be a witness for Christ, the soul with the winner, if you please, someone that's able to tell others about the Lord Jesus and how to carry on a conversation with others and to lead and guide and direct that conversation into the matter of the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ before them. This is where evangelism, evangelism is done. I bring you back again, as I have repeatedly in the past, the words of Moody. He wrote to that church, it was that committee in St. Louis that invited him for what then would have been the third citywide campaign in St. Louis, which he couldn't attend because of failing him. And he said, I've been 40 years in evangelism. And during this time, I've seen, seen tens of thousands profess faith in Christ. But I have yet to find anyone made a profession of faith in Christ, and lived ten years thereafter as a consistent Christian. But what there was someone who witnessed to me and prayed for me. 
before I came to town. I conclude that he, the important thing then, is not the coming of the young lady, but the intercession by and the witness of the people that are now living in St. Louis. I think this is true. Fellowship in witness. But there's something else. There's fellowship in the church. And so the apostles are concerned. They're keeping close touch with what's happening. The letters are sent. Messages are carried. And they heard in Jerusalem what God had done. And so they said, who among us is able to go and to help these people? And so we find fellowship of responsibility. And so Barnabas was sent. That he should go as far as Antioch. It was some distance. And it was a difficult journey. But Barnabas was prepared to go. He was there. He wasn't an apostle. He was a good man, a wealthy man that had sold his home and given it to the church. But he came representing the apostles. And so it ought to be that we see continually in developing in the congregation those that are able to take increased responsibility. You are going to discover that your Christian life is not going to become effective on the basis of some tremendous thing. You know, a lot of people say they were on the wrong side of the road at the wrong time, and that's why they were uh, not successful. No, I believe that if you're going to have a ministry for the Lord, it's going to be doing each day the simple tasks that come. And Barnabas did it. So there was this fellowship in responsibility that was shared by the apostles and by Barnabas. But I want you to see something else that's extremely important. Barnabas was a good man. Barnabas was a generous man. He was a man full of the Holy Ghost and faith. And I have proof for it because Barnabas knew he needed help. And he knew and he decided to send for him. And he sent for one that would completely outshine him, one that would completely obscure his ministry, one that was going to put him completely in the background. And one that was safely residing up in Tarsus and wasn't being hurt from. And was thus no threat to his promise. If Barnabas had been interested in promoting himself, he did the most foolish thing he could have done by sending for Saul of God. But you see, he was a good man. And full of faith. And full of the Holy Ghost. And he wasn't the least concerned. He was quite prepared, I'm sure, to say with John, he was him but I must see him. And he was quite prepared to send up and bring this man of whom the disciples had been afraid. He had introduced Saul, Paul down in Jerusalem to the disciples. And they'd withdrawn from him, not at all sure. And Paul, I am confident, drew from his own experience when he wrote to young Timothy, he said, lay hands on no man. Don't appoint people too quickly to responsibility. Don't say to this young convert, oh, you're a deacon. Don't say to this young man, you're an elder. Don't lay hands on people suddenly. Don't ordain them suddenly. Because if you do, you'll get into trouble. And if we do, we get into trouble. And so the apostles had sent Saul up to Tarsus, and they waited. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And they didn't send for him. But you see, there was a time when he was needed, and he was prepared. He'd spent three years postgraduate work in the backside of the desert, unlearning, getting ready to uh, minister. He had uh, been content to just stay in Tarsus. And frankly, I think that he was just running a little tin shop up there. I don't know what the rest of you think, but I just think he'd gone completely out of the Pharisee business. He had no living there. And every Jew that day had the had the wise parents and a wiser society that said that they had to, at the time of Bar Mitzvah, they learn a trade because they was just they were afraid, you know, that something like this would develop. Mm-hmm. And I think he had a nice little business up in Tarsus and was sitting there. He learned much about the Lord in those three years in Arabia. He was having sweet and warm fellowship with the Lord. He had this revelation of Christ, and he wasn't particularly worried. He wasn't. Uh, he was just a sailor. And the time came when the Spirit of God pressed upon Barnabas' heart, ready for Saul. My friend, if you are ready for his service, there will come a time when God finds a place for you in the church. 
It's imperative, therefore, that you should understand that if you are to be used of God, you must allow God to win you what he desires to do. And so, three years wasted, someone would say, this brilliant man, this scintillating intellect, this eloquent orator, and here he is, just sitting in the desert, and now up at Parchment. What a waste. What a pity. What a waste. Waste? Waste? Ever. Not a waste. The only thing that is a waste in a Christian's life is when he's out of fellowship with God. But as long as he's in fellowship with God and in, in the Word, whether he's used or not used, that is profitable time. The arrow that's being polished and the shaft that's being smooth is not being wasted because the time will come that only the polished arrow can do the bowman's bidding. So God has been polishing this shaft. Is God polishing you? He's polishing you in some little corner as he got you where the place where you were before and in prayer. And you're asking him to teach you the word. You're feeding, you say, well, I don't want to take a Sunday school class. It means too much study. My friend, if you are studying the word of God without a Sunday school class or some other ministry, you're living in disobedience to God. Because God said, study. To show thyself approved of God. A work that means not to change. If your study is conditioned only upon your responsibility, you've reached the limit of your service. And you won't have that, the blessing of God. You ought to study the Word of God, knowing that all Scripture is given by inspiration to God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, truly, Finish unto every good work. Now you've set a limit on your usefulness for God, unless you're studying the Word. Now I don't have reference to correspondence courses. I don't have reference to night school. These things are good. I don't have reference to just reading the books of other writers. I'm talking to you upon this which is study, which is concentrated thought and attention to the Word of God. Till it nourishes your heart and strengthens your spirit, and until you have something to give, something that's burning in you. As Thomas said, I meditated in the Lord, and my heart burned within me that I had to speak with Jeremiah's word. If I hadn't spoken, literally, I'd have blown a fuse. It's just the pressure was building up to the place where I, I couldn't stand it. Something was going to go. Are you doing that? All conscious wise. How could he have said, study to show thyself approved unto God if he hadn't been studying to show himself approved unto God? He said to Timothy, give thy attention to reading. Meditate in these things. What? Because that's what he's done. And he's done it in the Arabian desert. And he's done it in Tarsus. And so when the Spirit of God prompted Barnabas, the sweet and tender man, the son of consolation, you need help, Barnabas. You need someone to share with you. Your gifts, as they are, aren't adequate. Don't you see the fellowship of the church? The church needed every man as a witness. The apostles needed Barnabas, now Barnabas. Oh, how marvelous it is that every member of the body is absolutely dependent upon every other member. And my dear friend, there is something that you can do in the plan of God better than anyone else. If you're willing to be available to you. There's some life you can touch, some place you can fill, some work you can do. You're preparing for it by your attitude tonight as you listen. Now, what you're going to do before you go to bed, and what you're going to do when you wake up tomorrow, what you're going to do when you're on the subway going to work. You tell me what you're thinking about. You tell me where your mind runs when you release it from the task at hand, and I'll tell you the kind of a Christian ministry in life you're going to have. Whereas a man thinks it's in the dark, so it's
It's all that which is prepared just by being taught. Then the Spirit of God says, Barnabas, you need him. Oh, you need him. Barnabas didn't say, oh, my. Well, look what he'll do. He'll cure me. Oh, you see, he was full of the Holy Ghost. And he was full of faith. And his only concern was, who can God use for the blessing of these people? Who can be God's servant? Who is the one that can speak so? He didn't, he, he said he was willing to go as far as Antioch, but you know he went further. He went as far as God. He was prepared to go as far as God would lead him. And so he went on up to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Because Saul was important in the plan of God. And when he had found him, I like that. He went, where's Saul? Well, I don't know. He's come back from the dead. Well, where is he? Well, he's up there in, he's up there in Tarsus somewhere. I remember a few years ago, a man, young man in the ministry, went to a public relations company in Chicago and paid them five hundred or thousand dollars in order to make his name a household word. Well, they made it a household word, all right, but there wasn't much else besides. That's all. Got his name around. I've forgotten what it was now, but for a while it was uh, uh, quite well known. He paid a thousand dollars for it. He was firm. Well, dear friend, you don't need to do that. The only thing you need to do is just be at your time. With a heart filled with love for God, a heart filled with burden for his people, and your heart and mind filled with the truth of God, and your life poured out, and in due course, God will have some part of us that will seek you where you are for the ministry of God. He knew a parent down south. He said, my son's going to Bible school, and I'm just so distressed that there's no place, no church in the Alliance for him. I said, I'm not worried about that. This doesn't concern me in the least, but the only thing that I'm concerned about is that your son be prepared for any place in the Alliance or elsewhere. For if he has the preparation, God has the place. And the preparation isn't a diploma. The preparation is a relationship to the Lord. It's so vital and so warm, so rich, so continuous, that wherever one is, there's something to share. Walter Lewis Wilson, riding in my car in Minneapolis, going to a service at the First Presbyterian Church, looked at me. He said, Brother, do you sense what I have? So few of God's dear people have anything to give. He said, every day before I leave, I say, Lord, give me something warm and real and vital that if I touch a hungry heart, I can share with them. If I touch a needy heart, I can help comfort them. He said, it's just so few that there's anything from the Lord. Do you, when you go out in the morning, do you just fill your knapsack? Lord, is there something that you've given me for a burdened heart? Is there something you've given me for a perplexed heart? Something you've given me for a lost heart? Can I have something to share? I'm so glad that little boy had thoughtful enough to bring five loaves to fishing, aren't you? You go out that day way to find the hungry that God has left. Well, you see, when you do, there's always some opportunity. You'll have an opportunity if you have something to use. And I think many times God keeps us from opportunities because he doesn't want to embarrass us. When we have something from him, we have certainly a place from him. Thus, there'll be the way, there'll be the path to come. To come. I've just been groaning in my heart because I had to fly a few weeks ago over the rascal out there, south of Lincoln. That dear little woman, oh, I wanted her to come and meet you. Glad to see her. She was one of the dearest people that ever breathed. She loved the Lord. I have to take that little book of Christ in the midst every once in a while just to just sort of keep my own soul. But when I was flying from here to Denver to back, the great grief was that I just couldn't find the time to do my job for. To go and sit in her room in that little old folks home somewhere out of the Nebraska plains and just see what the Lord's been telling me about. 
because I've never met her, but what she had something warm and fresh to share with a hungry heart. And people still need to pass to her door because they've never been turned away. As long as she breathes, she's going to breathe out something that's worthwhile to her. All right, that could be you. But notice, there wasn't only that Saul was ready and God had a place for him and he was included in the fellowship of the ministry with Barnabas. But it was something else. It came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. I don't know when it'll come. Perhaps it'll never come. But you know what one of the best things could be for revival? Would be to go back to what happened a few decades ago in America when they started the meeting. They didn't say when they were going to quit. I get a little amused when I drive through the south. I don't see it so much up here. Drive down the south, it says revival beginning November 15th, closing December 2nd. They've got it all arranged with God, haven't they? It's nice, neat. They can turn it on and turn it off like you can the hot water in the hotel. Comes out boiling, goes off, it's all okay. Well, the only thing is they're having a meeting. One preacher said, Do you ever run a tent meeting, brother? I said, No, oh, I never run a tent meeting. He said, oh, it's great joy, you ought to do it. Well, you know, I, I really feel that if we'll come back to where the fathers were, and we say, this is God, and God, and maybe we can do that here. God is going back to the call. Man anoint. He'll just stay with us. And we'll meet, like Dr. Jesus did, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So heaven break. God comes down our souls to meet the Lord and crown to us. Now that's what happened here. So when he got song, he was stuck. He was stuck. He stayed so for a whole year. And they he taught. Jim, Jim Stewart, he was here with us in 1957 in our missionary convention, had that kind of a ministry. James isn't well understood in this country because all the anointing of God seems to be for Europe. He was in ministry down in South Germany and Austria. The Spirit of God said to him and his wife, Ruth, go north. Go north. He went up to Copenhagen, go north. He went on up to Going on. And they went on up. Finally, they got up almost the Arctic Circle, strong. And he was very, he said, Are there any believers? And he said, Yes, going to be believers. They went over and said, Brother, God has been leading you from down in the middle of the north. Yeah, I don't know why, but he's been telling me to go north. My name, by the way, is James Stewart. And the man looked at his shirt, changed his eyes, throw over the foot, he just prayed, you know. We've been asking God to give us revival. So we need him. We've been asking him. And we didn't know how to get in touch with you, where you were. But there's a little group of us in our meeting, so they met in the back room of the church for two weeks. There, we just broke before the Lord. The office was born. They told us. And then they announced to the Christians, a little letter went out to the Christians of the area, that we're meeting for fellowship in the Word of God to see what God has to say to his church for revival. And so they met in a little church building, and soon that was pretty well filled. Three, four weeks had gone. Then they said, and now we want to bring out the members of churches who are professing nominal Christians that they might see the wonders of Jesus. So another announcement went out. And it was about three or four weeks that they met till there was an evidence of the moving of God. And finally they said, the believers said, oh, we must take the auditorium. And they got the largest hall in Trondheim. And they went on for about another month. And it was filled. At six o'clock it would be filled. They didn't go home to eat dinner. They came. They sat there. When Brother the Steward would come in at seven o'clock, there'd be a service in process led by the Holy Ghost. 
Someone would start a song and they'd sing. Someone would get up to pray. Someone would start to weep and come and kneel to receive Christ. And sometimes he couldn't even preach. Do you know the last day when it was clear that God had finished? The mayor and the city council of Trondheim declared it a city holiday. All business is closed. And morning, afternoon, evening, they filmed and filmed and filled the auditorium again and again. And God brought revival to Trondheim. I'm wondering if that isn't what happened here. When God brought this man down, his heart had been filled with the love of God, the truth of God. And he taught much people. I think it's an oversimplification. I think God messed up. Because there was a fellowship. A fellowship, a witness that gathered the believers. A fellowship of the apostles that sent instruction to give name and strength to the, the church. A fellowship of Barnabas who reached out to find the man whom God would use at that time and in that way. There was fellowship. There was koinonia. There was sharing. And then Paul comes with a deep yearning and a burning longing that the people to whom God had sent him should have everything he had. He told back nothing because he wanted to leave Paul. He wanted them to know the Lord as he knew him. And God had in that place what he wanted. But notice the fellowship. All the way to sharing the communion, the, the responsibility, the vision, the prayer. Mutual care. It's not this thing. A revival for the work of God. It, it has to be yours. You have to carry it. Start. Then of course there's the whole church. And finally, there are those that are the responsible agents that God will use. I believe that here's a pattern for the blessing of the local church. Here's a pattern for revival. I want all of you to set by in your calendar, February 17th to the 20th. We're going to have the privilege of having Armand Gesswine with us for four nights. Just four I believe God wants to do something. We talked with him on the telephone the other day. Armin Gesswein, who was pastor in Long Island, but then went to Norway and saw God work in grave revival. Armin Gesswein has been living with a burning, groaning, longing heart for God to get revived and get a church that he could bless and produce. So you sent those days back. He's coming to us just for those four days. Let's ask God to meet us and prepare us for something that will be holy here. We thought perhaps it would be the week later, but it had to be this week for two reasons. Yes, and others. So we will remember that. I believe, dear friends, that God is wanting to do what is here, what he did there. But it falls on you. Each one carries the responsibility. It's on the eldership. It's on the pastor. It's on the man whom God will send to us, anointed to minister. We bear it jointly. We share it together. And so I feel that we have here a pattern. A pattern that shows us clearly that the Holy Ghost has a place in the ministry and a part for every one of us. No one's excluded, no one's overlooked, and no one's uninformed. Some who do different work saw Paul had one ministry that Barnabas didn't have. Barnabas had a ministry the apostles didn't have. The layman had a ministry the apostles didn't have. Each had his place. You have your place. May God show us that this is the nature of fellowship. The beginning of Paul's ministry was when he had been prepared to serve. God had prepared a place in which he could serve. The beginning of every ministry is the same. So if you will allow your Lord to lead you into the fellowship with himself that he desires, into the fellowship and understanding of the word that he desires, so that you have something to share, something that you can commune with others, 
then I think the scripture gives us every reason to believe that God has a ministry for you. Let us bow our hearts together in prayer. Are you willing to just find your place in God's plan? Are you willing to take him at his word when he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God? Meditate, give attendance to reading. Are you willing to be to the Lord Jesus what he's planned and desired? You see, you're very important. Everything seems to hang or fall on you. Oh, the church can go on without you, but it won't be the church. Because you have a part in it, a place in it. And so you're going to have to fulfill your responsibility. It falls heavily upon you. Are you prepared to say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then to do what he shows you? Our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise thee that thou hast given us this word that shows us the pattern of thy working, the plan of thy ministry. It shows us the place of every believer, the responsibility of the eldership, the particular ministries that thou dost choose, and those that have special ministries and teachings and exhortations. 